This isn't a hate video, nor is it me trying to tell you what to do, rather it's meant as education for people who haven't even done any of these mods, but are generally trying to make their car faster and are kind of just confused by all the terminology that is used on the car tuning market these days, since there's way too many options and a lot of them sound way too similar to another. So today, I will tell you which one actually makes a difference to performance and which ones won't. So here are 25 real or fake car mods. Throttle Body Spacer and Ported Throttle Body. Both of these don't really affect your performance all that much, however a Ported Throttle Body when paired with a proper cold air intake and a boosted setup and a tune will actually yield some measurable results. You may as well do it. Now Throttle Body Spacers and Ported Throttle Body sound very very similar to each other and they also cost very very similar to each other which is why I want to save people the trouble. The TBS or Throttle Body Spacer just increased is your throttle response. To really find the difference, a ported throttle body gets the term ported because they usually don't have a lip on the inside. They actually open up more airflow into your intake, whereas the throttle body spacer just spaces away, which again, just kind of increases throttle response. So it gives you the perception that your car is faster because you're now getting on your throttle the next one are roof spoilers and vortex generators, and roof spoilers for the most part are fake, and vortex generators do yield actual real results. So I will say this immediately, roof spoilers do serve a purpose on hatchbacks, SUVs, wagons. If your rear window and your roof is the fi like basically the rear portion of your car, that's like the final part, it's okay to have a roof spoiler. But if there's a part of your trunk that extends past your window, so like a fastback vehicle or a normal sedan or most coupes, roofs spoilers actually ruin your airflow. I will link to a video that talks about why that's the case. If you have an actual spoiler, having a roof spoiler essentially voids the entire existence of your actual spoiler because it diverts air away from it. What people get roof spoilers for is mostly just for looks, but also out of misunderstanding. They think it serves the purpose vortex generators do. Vortex generators will actually make your spoiler useful by directing turbulent air towards it. Another unintentional benefit of a vortex generator that I learned is that if it's a rainy day, you have a clear rear window. So all my Corvette, I put them on. And on rainy days, I notice that I can actually see out of my rear window because it's constantly pushing wind down against the rain on my rear window. So that's another unintentional benefit, but that's also proof that it's working, that it's actually shoving air down your rear window and directing it properly. Top mounted intercooler and front mounted intercooler. Here's the first surprise of this video, they are both real. For some reason, stupid automotive journalists have spread misconceptions that only front mounted intercoolers are functional. This simply is not true as positioning is going to vary based on engine type as well as what kind of boost is being used. Most boxer turbocharged engines will actually have a top mounted intercooler that is fed by their massive functional hood scoop. Most root system superchargers, like in my case for the Z06, are also fed by a top mounted intercooler. An intercooler does not, I repeat, it does not need to be mounted to the front to do its job. People assume that because top mounted intercoolers are close to the engine, they're more likely to heat soak and therefore don't actually function or do anything. And now that's just not true because again, most top mounted intercoolers are usually fed from a hood vent to begin with. So they get cold air directly rushing into their position just as a front mounted intercooler would. Short ram intake and cold air intake. Let me explain the logic on why people fall for short ram intakes. Shorter length does not equate to better cooling. People like to think that because it's shorter and closer to the engine, the length that the air has to travel is shorter so it'll reach it more quickly. It's also closer to the source of heat itself. What's the point of quickly bringing air to the engine when it's hot air you're bringing to it? A cold air intake meanwhile, so similar to the ported throttle body example at the start of this video, this is something you want to do paired with it tune. And even then, for naturally aspirated cars, the gain is kind of negligible and not even noticeable at times. So again, it really just depends on your build. It's what I like to call a future-proofing mod. It's not going to make a super noticeable difference. It does sound cool, and if you do plan to boost your car, especially to do like a top-mounted supercharger later in the future, it's a good thing to build towards to help get even more horsepower when you do that. Now you know why the video has an odd number count because this entry has three performance chips. There was once a time where cars had a lot dumber computers. Again, this kind of goes back to what I said with the cold air intake. If you have an older car and you're buying like a proper performance chip for a few hundred dollars, may give it a decent power gain. For most modern cars though, buying like a cheap universal eBay brand performance chip that's like $15 is not going to do a thing for your car. It genuinely is not. It's just placebo. You've convinced yourself that 
that because you changed something, it's now going to make your car run faster. An actual email tune or flash tune that's sent to you by a professional tuner that you then load on via device, like in my case, a Mustang would be SXT X4, which also works on uh, GM cars too. So I can use it on my Corvette also. That can actually load and unload and save many different files and so on and so forth. You could switch between 93, 87 tunes and whatever. An even more proper tune would be the dyno tune, which brings us to the third entry of this entry. So <laughs> three entries in one entry, you get the point. A dyno tune uses a device that we refer to as a dyno and it measures your wheel horsepower. And this is the most accurate and most, I would say the industry standard for tuning your vehicle. It's just gonna be way more accurate than a flash tune will because every car kind of has their own different quirks. They age differently. It's basically tuning your car exactly at that moment specific for your vehicle. Whereas flash tunes is more so made for your model, but every car will have different things that affect that, like different mods, different points in their lifespan, different mileage, and every car when it leaves factory, believe it or not, isn't exactly, exactly the same, but a dyno tune will always get the most power out of them. But flash tuning and dyno tuning are real methods, and I highly recommend that you just save up money for a proper tune intake fan marketed as an electric supercharger or leaf blower so you're probably like wow blade this looks like a joke of an entry you're absolutely right both of these are jokes but believe it or not the leaf blower is the real one of this entry i know some of you guys are probably like wow intake fan sounded like it actually no it doesn't do anything it's fake an intake fan which is just that's what i'm going to call it the more fancy terminology that they call it in the market is an electric supercharger and not the electric supercharger that actual electric cars use so again i'm not going to call it that anymore because that's way too cool of a name for some that's so underwhelming. These can cost $300. Don't fall for them. You're better off buying an actual colder intake and changing your whole intake assembly than buying an intake fan and shoving that into your stock intake. It doesn't make any power. There are so many videos that try to prove they make power, but I, none of them have run it on a dyno. Mighty Car Mods, meanwhile, did run it on a dyno and did find out that it does nothing. But you know what does do something? Leaf blowers. Mounting a leaf blower actually does make like seven or so horsepower. It's actually laughing that this is more of a real mod than an intake fan. I just put it in this video kind of as a, as a fun break. Now, of course, I don't recommend all you guys start putting leaf blowers onto your cars because for how much it weighs, it's you're still better off not doing this, but I'm just using this to meme the fact that intake fans are so worthless, a leaf blower beats them at their job. Lowering springs and coilovers. Both of these are real performance mods. So one of them obviously has a larger performance advantage over the other. Now, a lot of people like to associate lowering springs with cutting your springs and no, that's completely different. Cutting your springs, I guess, would be the fake one of this list. But people who cut springs just do it to make their car lower. They kind of are self-aware that it's not the best thing for their vehicle. They just don't want to spend any money. Lowering springs, meanwhile, they do drop your center of gravity. If you get a progressive spring rate, they're really nice and they're really comfortable. But when you actually get on your throttle, they stiffen up properly. The only downside of lowering springs is they're not adjustable and you also have to be very careful that you buy the correct size and the correct drop from the get-go because you can't change your mind later about fitment because again, they're not adjustable. I've had people who got too aggressive on lowering springs where they'll be like doing a two inch drop with lowering springs and then only to find out their car needed aftermarket caster camber plates to even support that drop or even worse, they're now completely shoving their wheel into their fender and it's just rubbing everywhere and now they have, and even rolling their fender won't help them. So of course, Coilovers because they're adjustable, you kind of can get away with the fact that you can buy them and if they don't sit the way you want, you can literally just adjust them until it does sit the way you want. So for someone who's brand new to lowering cars, I'm always going to be that guy who's going to recommend coilovers instead because, but coilovers are just so much more worth it where I would say they have so many bent low. I made a whole video about it. I'm actually going to shut up because I made a whole video about suspension. Just go watch that. Painting and wrapping. Both of these I would call real car mods. Now, neither of these are involved with performance, but the reason I have to mention them is because there is still a huge misunderstanding between these two. I'm gonna categorize these two differently from real and fake. Instead, we're gonna refer to painting as the real one in the sense that it's permanent. I'm gonna refer to wrapping as temporary, but I wouldn't really call it fake. I used to own a wrap on my Corvette, and I'm just gonna say it right now. Wraps are designed with the intention of being easily changeable, so therefore they are temporary and will never last as long as paint. A lot of people constantly ask me, hey, I got an old car, recently just got it done primered, and I'm either thinking about wrapping it or I'm thinking about painting it. Wrap adheres better to paint than it does to primer. You can wrap a primer car, but it doesn't solve the problem that someday the wrap's just going to come off. And when you take the wrap off, it's actually going to rip off your primer. It's going to rip off a lot of it. In fact, most wrap material usually has like gaps in between them to allow air pockets to sit. But unfortunately, those air pockets are also like bubbles. And really, that just brings it back to the point that a wrap will never look as good 
good as paint. It's always going to have seam lines. It's going to age much, much worse. So even if you do get a wrap that looks perfect for one year, at the second year mark, you'll see some lifting on the seams. You'll see some bubbles and some air pockets here and there. Around the third, fourth, and finally fifth year, that's usually as long as they survive. So never ever talk about wrapping or see it as a substitute to painting. Painting is something that can last decades. There are some cars that I know from 50 years ago that are still their original paint. And that's not me making fun of wraps. Again, that's their intended design is that they're meant to be temporary. And because of how modular and easy they are to change, they're cheaper than painting a car. So if you just want a quick color change, I'd recommend wrapping. I've made a whole video about this that I'll link to as well. And it really, really talks about everything you need to know about vinyl wrapping a car. Bald slash treadless tires or drag slick. You'd be surprised to hear how many people think bald tires can serve the same purpose to slicks. I always hear them even call these interchangeably like, yo bro, he's on slicks, but it's actually like bald tires. And the logic is because that tread is only needed for weather conditions or off-road driving. Therefore, on a sunny or warm day, a bald tire is basically a drag slick since it has all contact patch. And I'm gonna say this right now, false. This is a very dangerous mindset. It is indeed true that when a tire goes completely bald, it is nothing but contact patch. It doesn't have any tread lines anymore. It doesn't have any siping. So effectively, it looks like a drag slick, but it does not behave like one. Actual drag slicks are meant to properly adhere to paved surfaces. They usually have specialized compounds to do so. A worn out bald tire, meanwhile, is completely worn out. You've gone through most of the compound. You're basically about to ride on their wire and I've seen people blow up their tires on actual drift events or actual drag events on bald tires because they were stupid enough to think like you'd be surprised the hell again there's some of you guys in the comments are probably like there's no way people do stupid never underestimate the power of stupid wheel spacers and hub centric wheel spacers so neither of these I would consider fake but I would say one is significantly safer than the others so similar to the throttle body one they come down to a very thin margin it's mostly wording that changes is the entire way either of these work. So in this case, a hub centric spacer, that word, hub centric is ultimately what's going to save you from a lot of trouble and that's going to make the difference if you ever buy wheel spacers i highly highly recommend you buy hub centric ones because they don't allow your wheels to do that weird bouncing feeling that you get when you ride on normal spacers or ones that aren't hub centric and more importantly they're, they're just safer a lot less vibration will happen a lot less shaking is going to happen larger straight piped exhaust versus properly sized crossover piping for exhaust let's talk about the logic to why a lot of teenage hot boys think Think that large straight pipe is the way to go. First off, YouTube clickbait. Second off, TikTok. Third reason, they think that bigger is better because large tube straight from engine back to exhaust, boom, power. So I'm gonna say this right now, giant straight piping, it is indeed the loudest exhaust you can get for the cheapest price because it's free at times if you're just going to cut off your own mufflers and your own resonators and catalytic converters. And that's why most people do it is they just want noise. But this is why it's not good for power. And I'm actually going to, this is an, I've done this example before, but you can do this experiment right now at home. Find a straw, like a thin straw, and then find an empty paper towel roll. Blow through both of those using the same force. Which one actually has the air escape out faster? The small, more pressurized straw or the large paper towel tubing? Think about it like this. If air has too much room to move, they're dissuaded from finding the exit as soon as possible. This matters a lot on low horsepower cars. So if you have a 200 horsepower grocery getter, you do not need a five inch straight pipe all the way from header back because what the air is doing is it's not pressurized anymore and it's barely it's just leisurely strolling its way out of your car sure you're going to be making race car noises but you're not going to be accompanied by race car performance adding a crossover be it an x or h or even a helix pattern as well as keeping the air properly pressurized by properly keeping a good exhaust size it's just more efficient this actually increases low end torque as well as peak horsepower because now the air is not just going straight out through now obviously the downside to why a lot of teenagers don't do this is because it's more expensive is because it takes more scale to machine and produce something that isn't just a straight tube another reason is because they're not as loud and again your average teenager who especially one who grew up with daddy issues is going to be sad about not getting the attention they want so how dare i just suggest an actual performance alternative
alternative in lieu of their stupid attention-seeking desires. Fake rep wheels and real, real wheels. Wow, this couldn't be more explanatory. Having said that, that's gonna be it for this video. If you enjoy cars and car content, make sure to subscribe and make sure to like this video to help boost it in the algorithm. I will really, really appreciate it. Other than that though, thank you for watching and see y'all next time. Blade Angel out.